Yeah, so actually, uh, Frank and I both started off as uh, PhD students at Berkeley. Um, and one of the main projects that we worked on together was this exoshuffle project, uh, which was looking at how we can do MapReduce on Ray. Um, and Frank will tell you more about that later in this talk. Um, but for first, I wanted to talk a little bit about just the Ray data plane in general, um, how it came about, and um, you know, some of the major events that have happened there. Um, so hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you'll understand a bit more about the role of Ray data plane in uh, some of the libraries in the Ray ecosystem, like Ray Data. Um, you'll understand some of the history of the design changes. And also, Frank will tell you about how we were able to leverage this um, to beat the cloud sort world record. And uh, if you're not familiar with this, the cloud sort uh, benchmark is a benchmark for, uh, that measures the cost of sorting 100 terabytes of data. Okay, um, so first I wanted to give a little bit of motivation for why uh, we built the Ray data plane in the first place. All right, so as probably many of you are aware at this point, um, data and ML applications are, of course, memory intensive and distributed. Um, and that's often so that we can scale to larger data sets or to larger compute clusters. And what we saw was that before Ray existed, uh, we really felt that there was just not a good distributed memory system out there for Python. And to illustrate this, um, I'm pulling some results here from a comparison that we did back in 2021. And this was looking at <clears throat> this micro benchmark comparing Dask uh, to Ray. And this is a very simple workload, just passing a large object uh, between a bunch of different tasks and looking at scalability with a number of nodes. And what you can see here um, in this graph, so this is measuring runtime, uh, meaning lower is better. And what we can see here is that with Dask, uh, some of the, the design choices that they had in their uh, distributed memory system uh, led to poor performance. Um, so if you used multiprocessing uh, in Dask, you could avoid uh, any issues with uh, gil contention. Uh, but it also meant that a lot of unnecessary memory copies because uh, these processes couldn't share the same data. If we used multi-threading, we could avoid that problem, but then you became quite sensitive uh, to whether the computation required holding the gill or not. And so this actually led us to build this Dask on Ray uh, system, which was basically a plugin uh, for the Dask library that used the Ray data plane as the execution backend instead. And what we can see here is that we're able to really improve the runtime by uh, leveraging shared memory and also using Ray core for parallel execution. And so some of the things that made this possible in the Ray data plane, uh, when we think of the Ray data plane, it's essentially this distributed memory layer uh, for all application objects that are created in Ray. Um, so basically this is all of the different values that you have for Ray object refs. And the data plane provides a number of nice features here, um, including being able to do uh, shared memory reads with zero copies, um, as long as you're using uh, type, uh, types like NumPy or Arrow. Um, it's distributed by default, so what that means is that uh, the Ray data plane gives you transparent transfers between uh, different Python workers, uh, both within the same node and across different nodes. It gives you a number of uh, important memory control features, so that includes being able to transparently spill between memory and disk, and also garbage collection. And finally, it's able to automatically recover from certain kinds of failures. So the way that this all works, uh, just to give you an illustration of this, is when we think about a typical array cluster, the array data plane consists of these different components. Um, so first, we want to think about where the object metadata is stored, and this is usually stored at the driver. We call this process the owner uh, because it owns the metadata that's related to an object, and the way that we assign the owner is basically based on who created that first object ref. Uh, so if you call foo.remote, then you're going to own the object ref returned by that. For the actual object data, we have two different ways of storing that. Um, for very small objects, these are really quick to copy, and so we actually just store them directly at the owner and copy them between workers. And this is actually just like using an RPC library like gRPC. So this makes reading really fast, but it doesn't mean that we create a lot of copies potentially. So for large objects, uh, we have this additional optimization of having this shared memory object store. 
And so here, even if one Python process has an object ref, the actual value for it might live on a completely different node. And the main benefit here is that you can get this uh, kind of distributed memory abstraction, and you can also share the same copy of the data as long as you're on the same node. Okay, uh, so the Ray data plane has actually gone through quite a few changes in the past. Um, we always had shared memory, actually. So from the very beginning, uh, we na uh, natively supported Arrow, and we had this shared memory object store. Um, but in the first version, uh, the first major version of Ray, uh, which was released in 2020, we introduced a couple major uh, design features that were really important for stability. Um, so these included automatic memory management through reference counting, and also reliable failure detection and recovery. So building on top of that more stable core, uh, we were able to support more advanced features like being able to spill from memory to disk. And that in turn allowed us to build out these more advanced uh, data plane libraries um, such as Ray Data. And at this point, we also started kind of pushing the scale of applications that we were able to support. And that of course culminated in the cloud sort world record, which Frank will tell you more about. Okay, so I also thought it'd be fun to go through some of the libraries that are using Ray Data Plane today. Um, I already mentioned Dask on Ray, uh, which is a drop-in replacement for Dask that uses Ray, uh, the Ray Data Plane as its backend. Uh, I also mentioned Ray Data, and you've probably heard this um, uh, throughout this summit. We have a few different talks here from both the developers um, as well as users of Ray Data. And this library is basically meant to do last mile data preprocessing uh, for both training and batch inference workloads. Uh, there's also a few other libraries that are contributed by the community. Um, so we have Ray and Polars uh, combined in the Quokka library, and this implements uh, streaming time series data frames. Uh, we have the Daft library, which gives you distributed data frames uh, for working with ML data sets. And finally, we also have a Ray SQL, which is a combination of, uh, which is a distributed SQL engine that's built with Ray and Apache Arrow. Um, so actually, I think the developers of all of these libraries are here at Ray Summit. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to go and talk to them in person. Okay, um, so I've mentioned this a couple times now, but I just wanted to go a bit more into this cloud store benchmark and why we think this is such a big deal. Um, so the previous record here was set in 2016 by Spark, um, but it actually wasn't the open source version of Spark. Um, it was a specialized fork that was built specifically for this benchmark. Um, so in contrast, we actually broke this record recently uh, using an official release of Ray. And that was actually possible because the main distributed sorting logic was actually all implemented at the Python level, and that was as a part of the ExoShuffle project. And one of the reasons this worked is because we were able to leverage the Ray data plane to get this, uh, this good performance. And so I think this shows that you know, even though we think of Python as being traditionally kind of a slow language, uh, when you combine it with Ray data plane, you can actually get these pretty amazing results. All right, so uh, finally, I just wanna peek under the hood a little bit and show how the Ray data plane is involved with this kind of uh, distributed sorting or map reduce kind of application. Um, so here, when we, uh, this is kind of a, a typical Ray cluster setup that you might have. And so we first will execute some map tasks. And here what's going to happen is once the map task completes, it creates uh, one of these Ray objects for each reduced task. And these get stored in shared memory. Uh, once that shared memory store fills up, it's going to spill automatically to disk. And so here we can see where uh, Raycore's transparent spilling is actually coming into play. And so Raycore will guarantee that the memory usage here uh, stays under a certain limit. Later on, we're going to submit some reduced tasks which have dependencies on those map outputs. And so from here, we're going to transfer one map output uh, from each of those map tasks. And here we can see where the transparent uh, distributed transfer is happening. And so there's also a number of uh, nice performance optimizations that are happening under the hood here. Um, so things like being able to overlap this transfer uh, with the execution of other reduced tasks and also multiplexing this transfer across multiple connections. 
Okay, and then of course, once this reduce task reads this, uh, these objects, here is where we can see the benefit of using this shared memory approach where we get these zero copy reads. All right, so next I'll hand it over to Frank to give you more details on how um, we were able to break the cloud store world record with this. Thanks, uh, Stephanie. So yeah, hi, I'm Frank. And uh, yeah, I think uh, let's dive into some cool things that we did to actually achieve that uh, cloud sword world benchmark. So to understand, um, uh, maybe let me recap with what the cloud sword benchmark is and, and why we're doing it. So um, sorting sounds like a simple problem. If you're just sorting a list of 10 numbers, it's, it's trivial. Um, but actually when the data size is huge, as huge as 100 terabyte, this is actually a system design problem because if you think about the input data has to reside on some sort of storage and they're moving the data from storage to compute and then there has to be an execution engine for 100 terabyte, it is usually a distributed execution engine and then you're gonna do the compute, um, you're gonna do the sorting and then you're gonna have to um, pipe all the data back into the storage. So on a high level, this uh, such a cloud source system has to um, has to have three three components. So there's execution on top, that's the software, and there's also the compute cluster, and then finally there's the storage layer. Um, so the previous uh, cloud store record was set by Apache Spark in 2016. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, this was sort of a uh, specialized fork of Spark um, to implement these uh, some low-level automations in order to uh, make the sorting happen. And then that was running on Alibaba Cloud at the time because that was, I think, the most uh, competitive in terms of pricing. Um, and then it was running, it was putting the data on a set of uh, H uh, HDFS cluster on like um, traditional like hard disk drives. So what's changed? In our uh, ExoShuffle Cloud Sort benchmark, we, uh, here's the architecture here. So a few things are different. Um, I think the most notable thing is that we're able to run this on top of Ray, like a public release version of Ray unmodified. Um, so basically we simply implement the sorting um, strategies and algorithms on top as this Python program. And this Python program runs on the Ray cluster, which in turn runs on the Amazon uh, EC2 cluster. The other change is that uh, we're able to actually leverage um, the advancement in cloud technology as well. So uh, uh, Amazon S3 has become a lot more faster and uh, stable over the years. So we're actually able to store all of the data uh, on S3 and then um, also write the output there. So the uh, cloudsort.py that uh, program essentially is less than a thousand lines of Python code. And then we're able to uh, beat that uh, price record by about 30%. Uh, speaking of that uh, number, so uh, you know, one reasonable question to ask is that, you know, that was 2016 and then, you know, hardware got better and cheaper over the years. So was it just an artifact of, you know, the, uh, the, the dollar value change? So we, we did uh, try to interpolate that same setup back in 2016 um, to using today's hardware pricing. And then we see that that's about like $1.15 per terabyte if that setup was running on today's machines. Um, but still, um, we're able to achieve about a 15% um, increase in price performance using this new architecture and technologies. So before I talk about how exactly we do that, maybe it's, it's uh, useful to give you some um, idea of like why this cloud sort record, this cloud sort benchmark is a thing. Um, so if you think about it, um, a lot of the modern data processing um, jobs the most expensive part in there is if you have all-to-all -all communication, which is uh, what shuffle refers to here. So think of, you have a bunch of uh, machines on the left-hand side that, that re read some data. If they, if they can do their processing locally, it's not very difficult. You can do this you know, in a parallel way pretty easily. But if they all need to communicate with each other, and then each, each node needs to send a piece of data to every other node, that is the definition of shuffle, by the way, then this creates an all-to-all -all communication pattern that is difficult to optimize. So why is it difficult to optimize? So let's, uh, let's uh, on the high level, this is because if you have n nodes in a cluster, this results in n squared number of connections between nodes because every, um, so think of like a MapReduce job, every node need to send a piece of data onto every other node. So this essentially translates into moving a very large number of small blocks across all nodes. Um, and let's say we are doing processing a terabyte of data, and then you have 10,000 partitions. It doesn't seem like a huge number, but if you think about shuffle, then this already translates into 100 million shuffle blocks, each of them only, only 10 kilobyte each, and you need to transfer those across disk, network, and memory. So this is difficult to optimize because one, this creates 
uh, I/O efficiency problems because, um, for example, hard drives are not optimized for random small accesses. Um, there's the problem with fault tolerance with 100 million transfers. You can bet on some of them might fail, so the system must be able to handle this, um, fault, uh, these faults transparently. And finally, there's a problem load balancing because um, if the, uh, so ideally we want, we want the pipes to be saturated as much as we can, but um, if they are skewed in, in, in the data, then this becomes a challenging problem as well. So let's uh, maybe go bottom up from that stack and let's first talk about uh, how we select the uh, hardware configuration for, for making the call sort record. So um, we thought of a few principles that we need when we're choosing the EC2 cluster uh, shape. First of all, we want to use as few nodes as possible. Um, and why is that? Because um, I should mention one more thing. The goal of this cloud sort uh, benchmark is to find the cheapest way to run sort of 100 terabyte. Um, why cheapest? Because that's, I think, the most practical benchmark. Because in the end, we're running these large scale data jobs. They you know, run overnight, but we want to minimize the cost of running these things. So the, again, the goal is to minimize cost. So why do we want a few nodes, as few nodes as possible? If you think about it, every node receives blocks from n nodes and merge them together. So less nodes means a smaller number of n, that means the faster merge. So for example, um, if we are merging uh, 100 megabyte blocks, 10 of those things, it will be faster to merge these blocks, which are already sorted, than to merge 100 blocks, each of only 10 megabyte blocks. That's just, that's just more computation to do. So that's the first thing. Second, um, here's sort of an interesting finding we find on the modern cloud uh, world, which is that smaller instances usually have better price uh, performance to price ratio. This is a little bit surprising, uh, but what we find, the reason for that is because these smaller instances, so typically the cloud providers take a big machine and then carve them into smaller pieces and you know, rent them to you. Um, the smaller instances have better burst networking. What that means is that the, um, and furthermore, we find that the instances constantly reach the burst net networking performance. So what does that mean? Um, for example, we tried, we compared two instance types. So, so um, the first one is the 4X large machines. It costs $1.3 per hour. The baseline networking is 10 gigabit, but they call it burst, they get burstable to 25. And then we find that basically in our experiment, it always reaches a 25 gigabit per second link. In comparison, a, a twice as large machine, which costs $2.7 per hour, the baseline performance is 18 gigabit per second, and there's no bursting. So it always stays at 18%, uh, 18, 18 gigabit. So which means that if we use two of the smaller machines, we can get actually 50 gigabit of networking. And that's um, useful because um, we use the networking to, com to communicate with S3, to communicate between nodes. So the throughput is important to us. And then we find that only instances smaller than 4x large have burst networking. So combining these two principles, uh, we ended up deciding to use uh, the i4i 4 4x large nodes. Again, why 40 nodes, right? So if you have, if in theory, you have one node, and then that one node just you know, keep, keep computing data, that's good enough. Well, we need 40 nodes because we are processing 100 terabyte of data, and then each of these instances have a fixed amount of uh, SSD attached to it. Uh, we need some scratch space for write amplification, so that's why we need 40 nodes in the, in the end. That's the compute. So um, the second question is what kind of storage, there are a lot of storage uh, solutions to choose from today. The two main ones are either the, um, the, the object store, so S3 offers basically a, like an object store, um, versus EBS, which is a more traditional, they call it um, elastic uh, block devices. Um, and then for temporary storage, there is the, the choice between SSD and, and also the, uh, the blocks, block devices. So we ended up choosing S3 because uh, for a few reasons. Um, this is also sort of re re only recently true, um, which are, um, first of all, S3 now can, can provide very high uh, throughput and they don't actually charge for that throughput. So they, um, I should say they charge it by um, your instance networking throughput, but basically as much as uh, the S3 itself can reach as much uh, networking throughput as you can um, for, for that particular instance. Um, in comparison, for example, if you use a block device, you need to pay for how many IO per second or throughput you can get from that particular device. So again, for S3, you only pay for IO per second, so all of the read-write requests, and also the storage of the, of the data itself, which is also cheaper than the block devices. 
Um, third, this is also actually important because for S3, um, it's pay as you go. You don't need to provision for, for disk space. For the traditional ones, it's like you have to um, provision a disk and attach that virtual disk. For S3, if you have more data, you have spilled data, you can just use those as you go auto scaling fully. Finally, um, the data is, so S3 is like disaggregated storage, so it's not, it's not attached to the instances. So if you have instance failures, the, uh, the, the, your progress is not lost because the data is, se is stored separately on the storage service. Um, this would be ideal for like auto-scaling clusters. We actually also tried using spot instances, which you know, come and go more often than, than these on-demand instances, and then here the uh, use of S3 is actually crucial. So that's the um, sort of infrastructure side of things. And uh, I also wanted to uh, just give you a sneak peek of how the, uh, the, the program itself looks like. So this is heavily using the distributed futures reference uh, abstractions used in Ray. So if you used Ray before, this is, a, this is the Ray.ObjectRef type. So back to how Shuffle looks like. This is actually surprisingly easy to implement in Ray. So this, actually these two lines of code here uh, basically um, expresses this whole Shuffle um, communication pattern. So you have, uh, well, you need to define map tasks and reduce tasks, but once you have those, um, you just call map.remote of a particular uh, partition number. And then, um, if you're not familiar, this dot remote uh, calls essentially start a task on a remote node. In the meantime, they immediately um, return a distributed future, which can be, or these object references, which can be passed to other tasks so that you can you know, schedule the, all of these tasks in parallel. So we take each uh, output from the map out, uh, from the map output, and then we pass them. Um, so each reduced task takes each uh, one of each map output. So this essentially creates this um, n squared communication pattern. So um, to sort of summarize. Um, in Ray, the application actually only needs to specify a few things. It needs to specify the task graph, and this is a very powerful um, and expressive way of specifying them um, because, uh, because they can actually specify dynamic tasks. Um, optionally, you can tell Ray, um, and, and in this project we end up doing that, to tell Ray when exactly to start these tasks using the program itself, and also where to, sa to start tasks using the, uh, the resources um, tag. Now, just by writing that, you get a lot of things sort of for free as an application developer. So these are the features that Ray provides. First of all, it provides resource allocation, so it manages a cluster. It will put your task onto, onto, onto these nodes. Um, it does memory management. The data plane does a lot of memory management, uh, mem memory management uh, by, uh, for free. That includes the transferring, the actual transferring of objects between nodes. So Ray would handle all of the TCP connection, the failure recovery, all of those. It will automatically handle spilling to disk. So this is sort of like a generalized virtual memory concept. Like to the application developer, it's transparent. You have like infinite memory. But um, under the hood, Ray would spill objects to disk and then recover them when they are needed again. Garbage collection. So any references go out of scope. They don't take additional space in the object store. Um, another important feature of Ray is pipeline I/O. So this is for basically, for example, when you are sorting one partition, um, the uh, the uh, the transferring of the of the, for example, the previous partition can be done in parallel. So this makes sure that you can overlap execution with I/O to maximize the system efficiency. And finally, fault tolerance, which is about if anything goes wrong, Ray ha uh, Ray has this built-in lineage reconstruction that can basically recover the uh, the objects through uh, um, by recomputing. So this gives us this sort of pipelining thing, which is pretty cool. So if you think about sorting, um, it's like you start by downloading, downloading them from S3, you sort the blocks, and then you transfer the blocks to the receiving end, and on receiving end, you merge these blocks, and then you spill them. And then notice that how in every step, um, the, the original machine can start another task, and then this sort of create this cascading pipeline that fully saturate all of the pipes. And then on the, reduce, on the reducing side, you restore the blocks, um, you do, run the reduce, and then you send the results back to S3. Again, this can be pipelined with other uh, applications. So at the end of the day, um, we get this. So this is the actual system performance chart while running the 100 terabyte sort. Um, there's a lot of things on here. I think the, the, the TLDR here is that everything is saturated. So CPU is saturated. Um, uh, networking is pretty saturated. Um, we ended up using a lot of uh, almost all of the disk space. Um, and then also the progress here is pretty linear, which is pretty impressive for a, a very large scale system. 
I think we're going to skip the handling data skew part, um, and uh, but this basically tells you a lot of these um, more advanced techniques for, for example, dynamically handling data skew can also be implemented pretty easily in Ray. We can maybe uh, show the size later um, if uh, you're interested in this. So yeah, Stephanie, we'll talk about what's next. I don't think that. Um, I'll, I'll just speak loudly. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay. All right. So yeah, a lot of the things that are happening next are basically about bringing the, those performance gains that Frank talked about to end users. Um, so that's through libraries like Ray Data, and I won't go through the results here in detail uh, for sake of time. Uh, but I'm happy to connect you. Uh, so I'm one of the developers here of Ray Data, and we also have several others here giving talks. Um, so I just wanted to also quickly mention some of the things that are on the roadmap for Ray Data Plane in particular. Um, so here we're continuing to invest in all of the things that we think really made Ray Data Plane uh, useful in the past. Um, so for flexibility, being able to support more kinds of uh, different object stores, especially looking at different uh, hardware um, storage. So not just uh, host memory, but also things like GPU memory. Um, we're also looking at trying to enhance stability um, and also interoperability with other frameworks. Uh, cool, so I just wanna keep this short so that we have time uh, for some questions, but yeah, thanks for having us here. And hi, thanks for the uh, talk. Um, I had two questions, which is one is, um, did that 97 cents per terabyte figure include both the read and write uh, to S3? And the second one is um, for storing the raw unsorted data in S3, uh, what, were, what was the format you ended up choosing and why? Yeah, I can take that. So uh, first of all, the cost includes both the compute and storage. So it includes the, uh, the cluster, uh, compute cluster cost it includes the uh, cost to store the data and also the IO per, uh, the, all the read and get uh, requests, uh, read and write requests. Um, the second question was about what format do we use? Um, so um, that particular sorting benchmark was just like sorting like a hundred byte uh, like records. So it's like a, it's its own. So we just store binary records. Um, we could, uh, for like you know, actual real data, we could basically use Parquet to uh, store those. And then uh, maybe one thing we didn't mention here is that we also need to shard the data so S3 has also its own particular um, sharding mechanism to maximize basically the, uh, the overall throughput. So we basically store all of those data into like 50 buckets and then with some prefix, sh uh, prefix sharding, we can get as much performance, basically throughput we can from, from S3. Thanks. All right, another round of applause for Stephanie and Frank. Thank you so much.